Um, Hyperledger, PayPal. You know what? I'm going to take away the Ubuntu thing. Oh, man. I was going to run and go do it. You should. No reason you shouldn't. All right. So first story is now different. Roger. Let me copy and paste. Oh, computer. It's so old. It's not old. It's just the modern era. Modern demands have finally caught up with it. So I can, like, shrink up Slack right now, right? No more slacking is going to happen during the show? I mean, no, not from me. Sometimes Roger uses okay. it to alert us of things, but... Oh, it's probably ten, better. To it's probably MC better to chat. do it in the chat room because that's okay. where my eyes will be. So, yes. Tom, there's a giant spider behind you. <laughs> oh, Roger! <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Can you imagine I'm just telling you that, like duck. You know that's my April Fool's joke. There's a giant Every duck year. behind you. <laughs> Is there what? a duck? A giant duck behind? You? That's actually a goose. My, my my April Fool's joke every year. This started with my sister, and I now carry on the tradition with my poor wife. Is there's a spider on your shoulder? See, I can't do that because uh, I once actually had a spider on my head. It was crawling around. You can still do it. There's no law that says because you just said you got a spider, spider in your head. Your head. And I thought she was full of it, <laughs> and then it came down my shoulders like ah. It crushed brother, you lob. My brother told me once that the only thing he would never lie to me about was whether there was a black fly on my head because black flies bite. Okay. And so whenever we'd be out in the lake in, in Michigan, if there's a black fly on your head, you had to tell the person because they had to go on water real quick. Rule. Yeah. When he was about 30, he told me, oh, yeah, I was lying about that, too. I was just like to watch you go underwater. <laughs> Wait, so how does going in the water help? Because the, the fly, fly stays up. Oh, you just flies can't away. squash it. All right, we got to do the show, Roger. We'll explain how flies work afterwards. <laughs> All right, I need a control and I'm hiding. Oh, shoot. Cliffhanger. <laughs> Cliff notes. <laughs> okay, there we go. Where we go. Daily Tech News Show is powered by you, not advertisers. To find out more, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 11th, 2017. I'm Tom Merritt. Allison Sheridan from NoSillaCast alongside to talk about technology news and issues of importance. Allison, how are you? I'm excited to be here. I just love talking tech and love talking tech with you. Nothing better than that. And we're going to talk about subscription versus ownership of software and come down definitively on only one side, right? Absolutely. And ownership is in quotes because it's not really ownership either. Yeah, right. I mean, that's the secret, right? And and no, obviously, sometimes subscription is better, sometimes ownership is better. But we're going to talk about when and how it might be different. It might change, depend on different people coming into the marketplace. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Twitter just hired longtime Goldman Sachs banker and former Intuit CFO Ned Seagal, or Siegel, as Twitter's new CFO. He'll take over from Anthony Noto, who's been doing all the jobs, it seems like. he Noto was promoted from CFO to COO last November. So does this mean they're going to make money now? Yes, that is exactly what <laughs> Ned Siegel is hoping it means. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Elon Musk and PayPal have confirmed that PayPal let Musk buy back X.com, the URL Musk bought, uh, brought to PayPal in 2000. In a tweet about it, Musk said the domain has great sentimental value so is he going to use it for something or is he just collecting it i could see it either way to be honest yeah yeah yeah. he could just collect it right he might just be like yeah you know what i had six hundred thousand dollars or whatever we don't know how much he paid for it <laughs> laying around why not uh the linux foundation led hyperledger project has released its first blockchain code that can be used by large businesses to build software uh, this is the project that has more than 150 engineers from 29 organizations a bunch of banks bunch of tech companies cisco engineers people working on that project so here we go we'll see if it can actually make things more efficient and cost less for banks so the idea of blockchain in this context is to try to allow secure communications where you know exactly what's going on with the money? 
Yeah, right? they're, 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 I mean, Hyperledger, right? They're using it for all the things that a ledger is used for, recording transactions, communicating transactions, executing transfers, all of that sort of thing. But it's the information. It's not, it's not they're not starting a cryptocurrency or anything like that. Okay. All right. In an act of irony, AT&T will join tomorrow's Internet Day of Action by displaying banners supporting a free and open Internet. This is remarkable since the Day of Action is meant to express support for maintaining the 2015 Open Internet Guidelines, which AT&T has worked to get overturned. This is like the forestry company joining the Save the Spotted Owl protest. Like, oh, we want to save the Spotted Owl. And everyone's like, yeah, then stop cutting down the trees. They're like, well, we're going to cut down the trees, but maybe we can come up with another way of saving the Spotted Owl. <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm not sure what they're up to there, but it's very interesting. Uh, Microsoft is a pro outlining rather a program to take unused television spectrum uh, that's what you hear talked about as white spaces. It's the, the space between television channels in most cases and use it to provide high-speed internet service in rural areas of the United States. Plan aims to cover 2 million people in 12 states over the next five years. There are a lot of people who need this. Around 23 million people in the U.S. have no access to fast internet, mostly in rural areas. Separately, TechDirt has a, an article out pointing out a study commissioned by the broadband industry, so you can guess this is going to be somewhat conservative, uh, had co economists from CMA Strategy Consulting and Economist Incorporated finding more than 10.6 million U.S. households have no access to wired internet service with download speeds of at least 25 megabits per second. That is the FCC definition of fast. And an additional 46.1 million households live in areas with just one provider offering those speeds. So 50 million people in the U.S. have either zero or one option for 25 megabit per second speed or, or more. Well, Tom, that was a lot of numbers. Um, and I don't understand how Microsoft is saying 23 million people have no access to fast internet, but this commission says it's closer to, to what, 50? Uh, 23 that? million people have no access to fast internet. More than 10.6 million people have no access to wired internet service oh okay okay so fast internet could be download could be uh wi-fi or uh, cellular well and i don't know how microsoft is defining fast um but yeah. <laughs> but basically they're saying there's 23 million people in the u.s in rural areas that need our help so we're going to use white space to cover that uh and the tech dirt story is saying there's a lot of people who have no choice or don't even have access to the the minimal level of fast internet my guess is microsoft's defining fast internet as faster than 25 megabits per second now I know that they're they have not actually uh, they're gonna, they're going to be talking about this this today in more detail and actually outlining it, but I I don't quite understand how internet fits between TV channels. Do you know much about that? Like, is uh, that mean bit, on your yeah. cable? So or so on, on broadcast broad television, yeah, yeah it's not about cable. It's about wireless broadcast. Like between channel six and seven, there's space. The FCC. Okay when they allocated channels, left space between the channels to prevent interference. Now, that was part of the digital change? No, no. Well, what, yes and no. It, the digital change doesn't matter. When they allocate okay. space to channels, they, add, they left space between the channels, and they always okay. have. And what a lot of companies, including Microsoft, have been saying is, we can make use of that space between the channels without causing interference. Let us do that. Okay, and I think that without causing interference might be because of the digital thing. I think when you've got analog, it sort of bleeds into each other. And so um, it might have enabled this a little more. I don't know that, that that's the case. Uh, it's still it's still spectrum. Spectrum is spectrum. Uh, I think just technology and better in general has gotten better at limiting bleed over. Okay, all right. You may be well, right. That sounds like know, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I, I think... The, the bleed over is caused by the broadcast, not the qual not the content of the broadcast, because the broadcast well, is still yeah, radio no. waves, whether it's digital or analog. OK, OK. All right. Well, uh, that will be fun to see. And I think that's uh, can only be a good thing, right? Because that's a big problem. I would be really sad. That's why I live in the middle of Los Angeles and not out in the middle of Wyoming. Well, and, and my, you know, my sister, I talk about my sister a lot when these rural things come up because, you know, she's the closest person to me that that has this issue. But she lives out on a farm and they've been able to get better service over the years. But it's something she struggled with because she's not right by all the cables that get laid by the phone company or the cable company. Yeah, I don't understand those people with all that fresh air and nonsense. So. Mm, cows, <laughs> chickens. Exercise. Anyway, all right. Facebook is going to extend the beta test of ads on the Messenger home screen worldwide in the next few weeks. 
Tests of the ads began in Australia and Thailand in January. Unlike sponsored messages, which can only be sent to a contact with whom the advisor has had a previous conversation, ads in the home tab will be auction based and use the same super or the same user targeted methods as Instagram and Facebook itself. The ads can link out to a website or open a conversation in Messenger. Yay. I mean, yay. I <sighs> I'm not I'm not worried about Facebook making enough money to stay in business these days, so I'm not cheering for them. But I understand that they do need to continue to find ways to monetize their products, and that's fine. Uh, ads aren't my favorite thing, but I don't I'm not one of these people who who's like, ah, there's an ad on this. I refuse to ever use it. Uh, it's it depends on how annoying it is and how how good it is. And the targeting, I feel two ways about. On the one hand, it's creepy, and I don't like them knowing that much about me. But on the other hand, when it's targeted ad, it's much more likely to be something I would like to see than a waste of my time. Yeah, yeah, I I, I agree. More targeted, but God, ads in the middle of chat just ugh. <laughs> I, again, it really... it's always it's always the case of like, is it an ad you want? Then you don't mind it, right? If if I am in Facebook Messenger, and I constantly uh, am ordering pizza from Domino's, and I've been feeling a little bit like, mm, I don't know if I like it anymore. And an ad for Pizza Hut says, hey, click here and order an ad, uh, order a free pizza from Pizza Hut to try it out. I'll probably be cool with that, right? Because I was going to order a pizza anyway, and hey, free pizza, why not, right? So there are situations I can see where it will be good. It's all about the implementation. When they talk about the Home tab, I don't quite understand a home tab in Messenger. It's the home screen, basically. I mean, do, but, I mean, do you use I'm the Messenger app? For th uh, are you talking about mo on mobile? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's the home tab right down there. Boom. Huh. I never <laughs> noticed that. So at least it won't be I'm talking to you back and forth about yeah. when we're ever going to go to Steak and Whiskey. Not and it's going to pop up a <laughs> and pop and up an ad for Steak and Whiskey. And or no, open no, no. table or something. Yeah. The pizza one. <laughs> yeah. You should eat pizza instead. Uh, also, I want to hearken back to our white space conversation just a second because uh, w Wabbit Magic pointed out that the entire FM band, aircraft, and ham radio is between channels six and seven. Uh, so, mm. I mean, it was a bad example for me to use six and seven because there's already <laughs> stuff there and they won't use it for internet, but that shows you how much space there is between these channels that could be yeah. used. Yeah. Yeah. No, I keep a, uh, an electrical engineer on staff and about that, he said when it was analog, there might still have been space, but digital makes use of the bandwidth better. Yeah. It, it's more efficient. That makes sense. Thank you uh, for, for having that, that analysis at the ready. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> XDAdevelopers.com notes a feature in Android 7.1 called panic detection. Uh, it's not about you panicking. It's about your operating system panicking. It'll return you to the home screen of your Android device if it detects four consecutive back button presses with less than 300 milliseconds a piece between them. So something that would be difficult for you as a human to do, but a trick that malware often employs to stop you from exiting a screen while it's doing something malicious. So instead of being able to hijack your screen and stop you from doing anything, uh, Android 7.1 can, and it's not on by default, but it can detect that kind of, of action and stop it so that you can then kill processes or whatever you need to do. You know, it sounds really clever. I get a little more excited when Google works on, or is it Alphabet? Uh, I always I get this lost. This is Google. Google does it. Google. Okay, when they when they do things to try to help the root cause, like this in I think in Android Seven is when they're going to be uh, making it possible for the handset developers to upgrade the OS without having to upgrade all the other pieces of it, and and uh, so that's working at the root cause of getting people more secure. This hmm. is sort of a after you've already gotten hacked problem and well, our solution. And yes, uh, yes it, and no. I mean, clever. This is this is a kind of malware that says, hey, we can do something that there's no patch for because you want sure. to be able to use a back button. You don't want to remove the back button. So we'll just start sending back button things, you know? I mean, it's it's not a thing that you'd want to stop. You won't, you don't want to stop apps from being able to navigate because there's very good reasons and trustworthy reasons to do it. So what this is is, is another countermeasure that says, hey, you know what? We'll be able to stop the malicious use of that while not stopping the legitimate uses of it. Because yeah, the legitimate okay. uses are mostly accessibility and things like that. Right, right. All right. 
And so this is well, the patch that you want to happen automatically without having to upgrade the entire operating system. Right, right. Yeah, I just, I just like root cause fixes more than I like after the fact fixes. I like to fix the front end first. It's, it's a little, I think little this more is efficient. a root cause fix because the malware is doing a thing, and this but is the malware is already on your device. Well, yeah, but I mean, the root cause fix in that case would be never have malware on your device, and frankly, that's just not going to happen. There will always be ways that people can get malware on their device if they want. <laughs> But you can do more. Well, anyway. All right. Uh, Audi announced its first production vehicle with autonomous driving capability. The 2018 A8 will have level three capability, which means the car can drive itself in some driving modes, though a human must be ready to take over. The A8 featured a traffic jam pilot that can take over at speeds up to 60 kilometers per hour, which is 37.3 miles per hour. So in traffic. The A8 has more sensors than Tesla's Autopilot uses. Autopilot is considered level two. The Audi A8 will start at 90,000 euro, which is $103,243 US, coming to Germany in late autumn and the US in mid-2018. And no, Steve, you can't have one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> poor Steve. Um, I kind of want one too, although that's way out of my price range. But uh, this is this is actual self-driving car now the tesla is capable of level three so don't get too confused when you're like wait i thought the tesla could totally do this stuff it can but it doesn't use all of the sensors and the autopilot that you hear about requires that constant human interaction to be able to correct for its deficits and we've covered that quite extensively uh, regarding the fatality associated with the misuse of autopilot so this is this is a, the Audi saying this is actually level three. Like this is safe for you to allow it to drive during these conditions, and that's why it's level three, not level four, because it's not saying it can drive all the time. But if you're going less than 37 miles per hour and in stop and go traffic, you can just let the uh, the A8 take over. I love the the vision of just what would happen in congested traffic on our freeways that they wouldn't come to a halt. Because you wouldn't have the little fender benders. We just we just witnessed one where it was like this little bitty dent from one yeah. car to another, but it caused you know three hours of back. Well, it wasn't three. It's like fifteen minutes of backup, but still. Sure. I would love to see that go away. And those the, those accumulate, right? Because oh, that, yeah. even yeah, after yeah. those cars are gone, there's there's a slowdown. You you ever pass those ghost oh, yeah. slowdowns where yeah. you're like, oh, there must have been a wreck here fifteen minutes ago, and then the traffic just hasn't smoothed over it yet. And you feel terrible where you're going, well, somebody better be decapitated up here for this time that you wasted a mine. Then you get there and there's nobody you feel hurt. even worse when it turns out you were right. That's so, yeah, yeah it's, it's a no-win situation for anybody. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is exciting because we are getting our first uh, level three production car hitting the road. And, and, and I'm certain it won't be the last. I'm curious what the rules will be. Uh, I know Congress in the U.S. is working on some national rules uh, for autonomous cars, and, and, and it's, it's going to be a little bit confusing about what you're allowed to do in these things. Uh, and maybe that's part of the reason this isn't coming to the U.S. until mid-2018. I absolutely can't wait. Cannot get here soon enough. Bring it on. Let's I'm talk, ready. Let's talk umbrellas. Uh, the <laughs> South China Morning Post passed along a report from the paper.cn, the paper only in Chinese, South China Morning Post in English, uh, about a startup called Sharing E Umbrella. Inspired by the success of bike sharing in China, we've talked about it a lot on Daily Tech News Show, bike sharing is big in China, very successful Mobike spreading its business around the world. Well, E Umbrella was inspired by that and began an umbrella sharing service with 300,000 umbrellas across 11 cities in China. In principle, users were supposed to pay a small deposit and would incur a charge of, uh, you know, a few cents, essentially, a few yuan. I think it was like 0.50 yuan per 30 minutes of use. Every 30 minutes, you get charged a little more after your deposit. In practice, however, most of the umbrellas just disappeared. Now, I don't know if they were <laughs> not locking them down well or if the apps failed, but... Uh, the founder, Zhao Xuping, told the Post he is undaunted. He still intends to make 30 million umbrellas available across China by the end of the year. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, this is just silliness. I mean, umbrellas aren't that hard to carry and have your own. I mean, I have an umbrella that's this big. It fits in my purse. I just, I mean, not like I need an umbrella all that often. Sure. But. Well, that, no, and that's the thing, right? I get, because you don't need an umbrella all that often. Oftentimes you don't have it with you when you need it because there is unexpected rain or you forgot. And so I get where they're going. Like, wouldn't it be great in dense urban areas like like these cities in China if there was an umbrella serving sh sharing service that was a couple bucks for a couple bucks? Like instead of having to buy the five or ten dollar umbrella from the guy at the subway who's taking advantage of everybody who forgot their umbrella, there's just an umbrella sharing service. And then you you grab the umbrella and that way you never have to think about it. You don't have to carry it all the time, except it's silly. Ex well, I mean, <laughs> the problem is you don't have rain often enough and you don't have that situation often enough. And apparently it's really hard to lock down the umbrellas and keep people from just taking them. <laughs> Oh, it's adorable that he tries, though. I bet apparently he's going to keep going. Now, you laugh. You laugh, Allison. This is one of those I things I where I am not 50% certain that he's going to succeed, but I'm also not 50% certain. I guess I'm 50-50 <laughs> on it is what I'm trying to say. Like, this could be one of those things that takes off once he gets it right, and he has to lose 500,000 umbrellas before he can figure it out. Because the idea was, okay, we have to have racks where people can pick them up, right, by the subway stop, and then I guess they keep them at home, and they could tell the app, okay, I'm not using it anymore, but you can't share it out of somebody's home. So they got to fix that. But once they fix that, I, it might, it might be better than you think. Yeah, I just, I just don't know that the profit potential is there. It's also possible that I'm not qualified to discuss this since it hasn't rained since in Southern California. It never rains in Southern California. <laughs> but boy, let me warn you, when it pours, man. There you go. Pours. No and then you're going to need sharing the umbrella. <laughs> hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Uh, let's talk about subscription software versus owning software. And I was joking at the beginning because we're not going to come down ideologically. There are times when subscribing to software as a service makes perfect sense. Uh, for instance, you know, cloud storage, cloud document sharing, uh, and, and things like that make perfect sense. There are times when owning the software makes perfect sense. I don't want to subscribe to my IRC client as a service. I just want to have the software on my desktop. In fact, I would like open source software. But there's lots of places in between, and one that has shifted is image editing. It used to be, yeah, you buy Photoshop for a lot of money and then you keep that Photoshop until you've run it into the ground and then you buy the next Photoshop. And Adobe was having problems because it was feast or famine. Everyone buy the new Photoshop and then they would their, their earnings off Photoshop would decline and decline and decline until they came up with an upgrade. So there are benefits and costs to both the company and the consumer for both these models. Allison, you have recently been thinking this uh, about this because of Bart talking about it on his podcast. Yeah, Bart Bouchatz does the fabulous Let's Talk podcast, and one of them is Let's Talk, Let's Talk uh, Photography. And in there, he started talking about this question of how do you choose an application for image editing, for example, and that was kind of the focus of it. So, so Photoshop rental kind of came up in conversation in in his monologue on this, and one of the points that he he made was that having a sustainable set of income over time allows you to do better software development, that you aren't so focused on, let me just pile gobs and gobs of features that people don't want into an application. Or Instead, the feature just, that, that will get people to buy it, but actually doesn't improve the product because it, it doesn't improve stability or make things easier to use. Those stability and ease of use are often hard sells in getting people to upgrade, but they're the things that might yeah. make you more satisfied and, as a user. And security, and security of products. So what, Most what people happens are pretty today, good about giving you security updates, whether you're paying or not, but sure, yeah. These were his points. I, I would agree with what you just said, but he was talking also about the security of these, that if, you, if you're always getting updates, you're going to get the security updates. Um, but yeah, you're right. An example would be Office 2011. I mean, it's six years old now, and they still send out security updates for that. Yeah. But Microsoft has gone to a subscription model, and actually in um, High Sierra, you won't be able to use Office 2011. So I've been forced to go to Office 365, and that made me think about it in that context as well. So I sort of launched off of what Bart said and started a discussion on my uh, on my podcast about about the question. And it's I, I don't know that I buy into all of his arguments because if if you talk to people about this and I as since I posted it I've got a lot of conversation going on about it people are massively rapidly against 
subscription models, some of them, mm -hmm. but I don't find many people massively, rapidly in favor of them. I find resigned to it. I find, well, it seems like a good price, you know, 10 bucks a month for Photoshop and, and Adobe um, uh, Lightroom that, you know, it's a, it's a good deal, but they're not like, it's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I noticed the same thing. We were talking about this in our, in our Slack uh, for the, for the analyst level patrons and the people in favor of it were either reasonably favorable or they were enterprise level, right? And there's there's yeah, a different there's yeah. a different angle on this if you're talking enterprise. Gadget Virtuoso said, for the company that wants to upgrade at least every other year, the subscription model is the way to go. The cost of Adobe Creative Cloud was almost three years if you purchased, so we actually saved money on the subscription model. The CBA for Autodesk is quite similar. If you wanted to upgrade any sooner than every three years, subscription was cheaper. You've got lots of different scenarios then when you're talking about a business that has multiple licenses, that has to have certain features to keep up in a competitive marketplace versus us as individual consumers who are like, my Photoshop's still working fine. It does what I need it to do. Why do I need to upgrade? Don't make me upgrade. Oh, wait, if I'm paying a subscription, I'm being forced to upgrade. And maybe I wouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm not a, a Luddite on software. I'm the kind of person who's got to have the newest hotness. You know, I love having the new thing. So I'm not the kind of person who hangs on to old things because I don't want change. There are people like that for whom this is a bad thing too. But I'm starting to see these things where they get worse. I mean, Office... 365 on the Mac Excel on that, it's much slower. It's got all these animations. Like when I try to drag things, I mean, it's just got a bunch of stuff I don't but need. But that would be and true if, it, if you were paying for it or subscribe uh, alone or subscribing, right? That's but I would just have the fact a choice. that the older version doesn't work on your operating system right, anymore. But right? I would have a choice. You'd have a choice. If that were the case. Between what and what though? Well, in, in, before they made it where it didn't work, if I had a choice of, of a standalone version or the subscription model, if I get the subscription model, I can't stay with the old version. If I buy it, yeah, I can, can stay with the with, old version. Well, with Office, you can. You can stay with the old model as long as it still works. But subscription or standalone, 2011 just doesn't work in High Sierra. That. That yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's true. That's true. That that one example. But um, I use uh, one password and text expander. And text expander, they said, "Oh, Allison, come on, come on, come on, try the subscription model. It's great. You're gonna love it." Well, I don't love it. It's always asking me for network connections. It doesn't find my database. I don't like mm -hmm. it as much. Yeah. Or uh, one one password. They went to uh, that you can still get one password standalone, but they bury it. And I think you have to send them an email to get it and that kind of thing. And there's people that don't want their one password in the cloud. You can't do it without that now. Yeah. So the the feature set is changing to things that maybe we don't really we don't really want, and that concerns me. Well, but a lot of that of has the, to do with how good the company is at it, right? Subscription is an entirely different way of doing things. And I'll I'll grant you, in the early days of Microsoft Office 365, I was on the verge of wanting to go back to standalone. I liked having access to all the current working versions. I could switch between 2011 and 2013, right? You know, I didn't have to stick with one of them because I had the subscription. I could put it on multiple devices without having to pay extra. That's a huge that's benefit. That's really nice. Right? Yeah, that's but really nice. It would sometimes, when I was offline, just stop working and say, hey, uh, you need to log in and prove that you're paying for the subscription. And I'd be like, that. I don't have an internet connection right now. What, I can't use my word processor? That's, it doesn't do that anymore. They've worked out those quirks. But I think that's important I'm... when evaluating this is how good is the company at delivering a subscription service version of their software? I had that uh, exact problem just a few months ago, though, Tom, when we were in, it was either in the Galapagos or Peru, where, oh, really? where it, it, I did try to I get on. I haven't had that it, happen it, in years It eventually now. let me in, Yeah, but it, it gave me a little, eh, you don't have an internet connection. I'm like, yeah, I know. Well, it just whined, it whined about <laughs> I mean, it. I'm in an island. So the thing about Photoshop came up specifically because... Um, uh, a company called Serif Labs has come out with Affinity Photo, and it's 50 bucks on the Mac or 50 bucks on the PC or and uh, 30 bucks on the iPad. And it's real close to a full version of Photoshop. It's not a Photoshop Elements kind of thing. It's really close. They've also got Affinity Designer that uh, I think it's Illustrator that it, it competes with. And uh, it's a one-time buy. 
you know, you can buy upgrades and I'm sure eventually they will come out with something, but uh, they just came out with a massive upgrade, uh, 1.5 on the Mac and PC, and they didn't charge for that upgrade. It was huge. So there's a rabid community of people, those who are really angry about having to rent their software that are flocking over to Affinity. Now, it isn't altogether Photoshop yet but it's getting really, really close. So it, it's made the discussion a lot more interesting because there is an alternative. Well, and, and I think they're tapping into a very, a very smart market, which is, again, in business, you know you're going to need software for the next five to 10 years as long as you're in business, right? So you don't care about a subscription versus paying once. If you're a consumer, you're like, hey, if I lose my job or or the kid's college tuition ends up being more expensive than I thought, I'm gonna wanna cut costs. If I have a subscription and I have to cut that cost, I lose the software. If I can afford and to buy to Affinity files. today, then I will buy it and I'll be able to use it until it just doesn't work on my operating system anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's, I feel a little bit like we're getting uh, nickel and dime to death on this. You know, uh, remember, I don't know if you're probably not old enough, but uh, TV didn't used to cost money. You talking? bought a TV. Oh, you're so nice. Yes, of course I remember when you just had broadcast television <laughs> and how and how my grandpa just railed about how dumb it was that my parents were paying for television when there was nothing good on anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, you know, there was a brief period where telephone was really inexpensive and now we pay a fortune per month. I was talking well, about this on my local podcast. Local calls were inexpensive, but long yes. distance was way expensive. Honey, so. it's long distance. Yeah, yeah there you go. Uh, I was talking about this on my podcast and, and uh, George from Tulsa said something great. He, I had just finished doing my plea for Patreon and he said, yeah, you know, Patreon's a monthly fee. It's just, yeah, right. But you have a choice of whether to do it or not and you still get the content. So there. Well, and it depends, right? Uh, certain content, you it depends on the Patreon too. But yeah, uh, yeah, you again, get extra again, stuff. Sure. There's there's all different reasons for subscribing. I actually really like subscribing to Office because it's something I know I'm going to need. It's not something mm -hmm. that I can afford to do without for various reasons and various other jobs that I do. Uh, even though I use Google Docs for so many things, there are certain yeah, Excel so files and Word files for contract jobs that I have that I know I'm going to need it. It's a business expense. And it's nice to know that it's just always there. And I don't have to go buy it again to put it on a new or a second laptop or a tablet. Uh, but that makes sense in my situation. I can see someone else who's like, I've got one computer and I may not, I may just be able to switch to open office, right? I don't have to use Excel. I don't have a client that requires it. So I want to, or LibreOffice, I, I want the flexibility. I just want to buy it once. You know, I don't actually, you're going to find this hard to believe as such an Apple fangirl that I am. I don't resent Microsoft at all for this because you can buy standalone Microsoft Office. They price it in a way that as soon as you're like two people with three devices, all of a sudden it's worth it to do the subscription. Yeah, yeah. But you have that trade-off. You can make that choice. It's these companies that say, nope, now you're doing a subscription. That's this your only you choice. Got. We're not going to yeah. let you have it. Then you feel like you're taken hostage. And I think making your customers resent you is maybe not a good feeling. So with the Affinity example, I think when, when people talk about um, maybe a, something that Affinity can't do, people will go, yeah, but it was only 50 bucks. I was able to buy it and I don't have a subscription because you're, you're, you're defending the company because you are so happy they haven't got you held hostage. So I think any business model that makes your customers resent you, eh, something to think about, you know? And I, like I said, I don't resent Microsoft because I have a choice. Yeah. Well, folks, we're interested in what you think about this as well. You can start a thread in our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can submit stories there that we talk about on the show, or you can email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com like these fine people did. Alan from the cornfields of Southern Illinois. I actually got a ch chance to talk to Alan at uh, Nerdtacular. We compared which cornfields we're from. Uh, said, when my now wife moved into our new home, I told her I was not climbing on the roof or crawling through the crawl space. I'm more than happy to pay someone younger and less prone to injury to manage those things. I still handle tech support for the family and friends because I enjoy it and they pay me in beer. In a nutshell, when you're young, money is more valuable than time. This balance tends to change over time. Plus, we don't have these services where I live. And of course, he's talking about Amazon providing the setup services for smartphone stuff, among other things. You know, uh, there's a book called The Number One Women's Detective Agency by Alexander McCall Smith. And in, in there, the, the main character lives in, in Africa. And she said something I'll never forget. The character said, when you have money, you owe it to society to employ people. 
And I just, just all of a sudden you're over the guilt of what he's saying is like, he's older, he's got the mm. money, he can afford to pay somebody. Look, he's employing somebody. It's a good thing. I don't know if you owe it, but it, it's, a, I like the <laughs> spirit of, of, of the phrase, which is like, hey, you're, you're actually helping people out uh, when you do Right, that. you're helping yeah. the economy. Uh, Bill in Huntsville, Alabama said two weeks ago, my wife had her pacemaker replaced with her previous unit. We had to transmit the data quarterly by holding an antenna over the pacemaker and placing a call to the manufacturer. The new pacemaker <laughs> transmits the data to a monitor next to the bed through Bluetooth during the night. And the monitor transmits the data to the manufacturer through a cell tower over the Internet. Manufacturer forwards the data to the doctor's office. Boom. Wow. That, I know, that is right? just so futuristic. I just, <laughs> it's awesome. Well, and from his wife's perspective, I imagine it's, I used to have to go through all this trouble, and now it just does it. I don't have to Well, think not to it. mention more often data, right? Yeah. That yeah. data getting there more often means maybe uh, corrective action faster to Absolutely. keep her alive and happy and healthy. That is so cool. I love it. And then regarding David's email yesterday, and I try to make this uh, apparent when we get email from people re recommending products that are, or not even recommending, but talking about products they tested. David was very careful to say, I'm not recommending these. These are just things I've been playing around with. Uh, he did mention less pass, and a lot of you folks wrote in and talked about how Steve Gibson has been uh, over several episodes evaluating less pass. And, and I, I don't think it's unfair to characterize Steve as less than impressed uh, with less pass. He's got a little ongoing back and forth with him. You can check out the most recent uh, update on Steve and, and last pass in security now 587 if you'd like to know more about why. But it's it's just another of, of what I was saying yesterday of, hey, we're telling you these things so you can go investigate them. Uh, and, and especially when you're talking about password managers, you should be very careful. Yeah, I think so. I hadn't even heard of Less Pass. I haven't listened to yesterday's show It's a cool yet. idea, and it's actually very similar to Steve's own idea in that it's, it's trying to get rid of passwords. In other words, yeah. it will create the password but not store the password. Uh, huh. But some of the ways it transmits information uh, probably need to be tightened up, it sounds like. I see. I see. Okay. Well, thank you, Allison Sheridan, uh, for joining us as always. Podfeet.com, if you want to find out more about Allison's thoughts, not just about subscription software, but all kinds of <laughs> things. You've been doing podcasts there forever, but you're also doing more blog posts over there, I've noticed, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. I've been really taken off on that. I used to do a single 5,000 word blog post a week, and now I do lots of little blog posts, So, which somehow ended up being more work. I'm not quite sure how that worked. But uh, uh, my big thing I'm doing now is uh, this weekend, I'm going to Woodstock, Illinois to MacStock, which is a gathering of Mac fanatics that grew out of the demise of uh, Macworld in San Francisco, put on by uh, Barry Falk and Mike Potter. So anybody who's in the Chicago area, if you aren't going to Mac Stock uh, or if you're anywhere nearby, uh, it's it's a fantastic show. I'll be presenting there and it should be a lot of fun. That's so That's funny. My, my freshman year college roommate, Mark Ladd, was from Woodstock, Illinois. Oh, uh, call and, him. And tell he, him to show up. He and I got together. <laughs> well, I don't think he lives there anymore. He and I got together oh. recently at a restaurant near LAX because he's got a startup. Uh, and it was so cool to, to get back together with him. So blast from the past, Woodstock, Illinois. There you go. So much Illinois on this show. I love it. <laughs> uh, we even got a little Michigan in earlier. Uh, in fact, uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff in the full version of the show, which includes the pre and post show. We were talking about grammar rules and our, our favorite bugaboos in the pre-show today. If you'd like to have access to that, all you got to do is support the show, patreon.com slash DTNS. If you're already supporting and you didn't realize you could do that, uh, go to Patreon and, and do a search for get the RSS feed or just look for it. It should be usually on the right. Sometimes, depending on your screen size, it might pop over to the left. But there is an RSS feed that is custom for every single supporter of the show. And you get the full pre and post show. It's the only way to get the pre-show for the most part at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. We're at facebook.com slash dailytechnewsshow and our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow, of course, we'll be talking about net neutrality with the Internet Day of Action and Scott Johnson. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Did they pick Woodstock simply so that they could call it Macstock? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, actually, Mike Potter lives in Woodstock, lives so okay. he came up with the name of it. It's so much fun.
it's That's a cool. really really good time. It's little, yeah, you know, it's just a few hundred people, but it's uh, it's just you know, real community one, feel. One of my favorite conferences of all time was Podcasters Across Borders in Ontario, and it was small too. Mm-hmm. It was you know, it was just a Wait, gathering. Ontario, most, California? No, Ontario, Canada. Oh, okay. It was that's mostly Canadian podcasters. Podcast Expo was there. Yeah, and I, 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 oh, that's right. I've been to a <laughs> podcast. Ontario, California. I've been to a podcast conference in both Ontarios, actually. That's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, I, it was it was really fun. Uh, sometimes those smaller ones are just better because everybody can spend time with each you other, can know each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's really fun. I didn't get to go last year because my stupid grandson decided to be born right then. Well, that Didn't was get a go. rude of him. He could have been born any day. Oh, by I the know, way, right? I should have mentioned this during the show. I mentioned it on Daily Tech Headlines, but Rich from lovely Cleveland had his baby boy this morning. Yay! He's got what a, a bouncing picture. baby boy. I know. So uh, big, big congratulations to Rich. Of course, Rich Strafalino, if you uh, have heard him fill in for me on Daily Tech Headlines, he actually filled in hosting DTNS uh, for the week that I was at Nerdtacular. For I did Thursday. not make the connection. That was Rich from Lovely Cleveland. That is Rich from that. Lovely Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Same Rich. He started the whole thing, huh? Yeah. And so from adjective I town kind of th- yeah i'm pretty sure he if he wasn't the first he was the second like he was right right there at the very beginning so yeah oh that's funny well i haven't been to showbot lately yeah so roger yes oh okay i didn't know if you couldn't if if, if <laughs> you could you. Spider it wasn't shirt. working before so i just uh ah gotcha okay I what just, do we got for titles all right, Tom will explain how spiders work. No, Steve, you can't have one. <laughs> Elon buys back his ex, which is kind of cool. Tom says this could take off. Allison laughs. <laughs> um, Microsoft changes the channels just in the panic of time. Audi drives you for $120,000. <laughs> in, in Germany, Audi drive you. Uh, sharing my umbrella, Ella, Ella, Ella. Ella, Ella. Ella. Uh, rent umbrellas by software. That's pretty good. Rent umbrellas by software. I like that. <laughs> oh, wow. Everything started shifting, moving. Got to use that freeze ball reading button. Man. I'm reading and it's still freezing. It's still moving. Understand. Did you press the freeze ball reading button? Yes. I don't think Is it, it should blue? be rent umbrellas by yes, software. Yes, both, both <laughs> ways. Uh, All right. Well, It's still moving. It's still moving. This doesn't work for me. Don't All panic, right. Roger. You're probably blocking the <laughs> script. How much? Oh, I'll block your script. <laughs> <laughs> is, I feel like Veronica. Don't get so mad. Yeah. Oh, it's happening uh, to Poodle Puncher too. So you're not alone. You have to be want hovering over, right to over it to stop. Mm-hmm. What, what should it, no? Just what, what should I hover over? Freeze while oh, reading. Oh, freeze while reading. Yeah, I think that's what. Because I'm hovering over everything. And, <laughs> okay. Uh, what the? How do I? Screw? Yeah, but what's the best title, Roger? <laughs> well, it's still not working. I like all right, all right. I like um, Rent Umbrellas by Software. Allison, what do you think? All right, that's, that's pretty one. pretty uh, on subject, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, it gets the umbrellas in there, and I normally don't like combo titles, but that one kind of just is really elegant. So it's usually not authentic if it's a combo. Yeah, it's usually too Plus, forced, whereas this one's perfect. Starting with Rent Umbrellas is confusing, which is always good. Yeah, it makes you pay attention. Because if you, you could start with buy software, then that would you wouldn't read the people the, would the tune out. They're like, sentence. yeah, buy software, fine. They're trying to sell me something. Rent umbrellas. Rent what? Umbrellas. What? <laughs> but it's not too confusing to where they turn away and go like, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Biocal awesome. says, oh no, it's broke. The uh, freeze while reading it, Breton is broke, Roger. So you're not crazy. Oh. Well, not because of that. Well. <laughs> Are you suggesting I'm crazy? Uh, I'm not making any evaluative statements about your mental health. You know what? I wouldn't argue your with mental you health. that point anyway. All right. So we're going with uh, Rent Umbrellas by Software. Yes. Although Ken from Chicago, I like Rent the Gun by the Cannoli. <laughs> you know, leave the gun. Keep, take the cannoli. No. Wait, what? Right. Never mind. You don't know that that famous quote? Leave Can't the gun. Can't that famous. Take the cannoli. <laughs> Just because that's very famous. People talk about it all the time. Leave all the gun, the take the cannoli. Even when you're in the uh, 15 night From the Godfather. Style. I remember key moments of the film. Allison, am I crazy? I didn't see the Godfather. No. <laughs> you know what? 
I have a show for you. I have a show. I'm going to break some news here. I'm going to pull a Scott Johnson. Oh, no. And it's because of Scott and I. Uh, we're going to start watching the greatest movies of all time and talking about oh. them on Current Geek. So oh, I actually went and I took several different rankings of the greatest movies in all, of all time and I, I combined them uh, to create an Uber ranking. And we're going to start at the top, which I believe is The Godfather, watch the movie and talk about it on Current Geek. So movies like How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, that kind of, that kind of movie? I don't know that that one's that on there. I'll have to double check. That doesn't make sense. What kind of list are you looking at? See, it's the Current Geek Film Fest. Come on, it's got Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey. So The Godfather, Casablanca, Citizen Kane, Psycho, Sunset Boulevard, The Wizard of Oz, like that. So not like Midnight Cowboy? Uh, Midnight Cowboy might be on here. You know, every year when I was a little kid, when uh, back in the, the old days, uh, when we had to watch TV real time, uh, The Wizard of Oz would come on once a year. And I always watched it. It was our thing as a family. And one year, my dad said, I was around 10 years old. He said, you know what, Allison? Another show is on a different channel, and I want you to watch it with me. It's the movie Harvey. Have you ever oh, seen really? that? Yeah. That was, on the, that was the counter programming to Wizard of Oz? Yeah, and so I sat up up in bed in his bedroom with uh -huh. we or his my mom and dad's room. We watched it while the rest of the family was downstairs, and that became a. Uh, it, it to me, it's a it means my dad. So uh, in fact, I bought the movie for him later on VHS, and we just watched it the other night with my kids. I let him uh, I, I let him in on it, and uh, so that's that great. But Wizard of Oz used to be a big deal for us too. My mom would would put out snacks, and we'd all sit down and make a big deal out of it when it would come on tv and it was like yeah like you said it was every year right so when you say harvey you mean you mean the one with jimmy stewart right yeah okay. oh yeah no spoilers i won't Rabbit but if you ever read see Rabbit the magic no. No Rabbit magic spoilers says harvey is about 70 my... year old movie Webbit magic says harvey is about my big brother <laughs> uh Fair. harvey is not on my list but midnight cowboy is oh but and no one Cowboy has urban cowboy. Does anyone have urban cowboy? Legal Eagles? No, Legal Eagles is definitely not on the list. I can guarantee that. E.T. is on the list. That's a great... Uh, is it? Oh, yeah. There you go. Poltergeist? That be fun. I like that kind of show of everybody watching together. And it's it's caused something, an interesting effect. Um, do you know about... Uh, what's the Star Trek podcast? Um, Star Trek podcast? Uh, this Weekend Trek? No, no, no. Oh, uh, Rod, Rod, Rod Roddenberry Rod sponsored yeah. one. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't think of the name of it with John and Ken. Anyway, uh, the interesting effect of that is I've had friends of mine say, oh, my God, did you see Star Trek last night? Right. Because we're watching the same thing together. It's like yeah, it has yeah. created the water cooler conversation. I was at, at the gym with Dorothy when she said it, and I was on talking to Bart in Ireland once when he said it. And and it's just created an interesting effect. Like, oh, man, so when data, blah, blah, you know, it just made it really fun. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to do a little bit on Spoiler in Time. Uh, is say like, hey, we're all gonna watch these things together and talk about them. We're uh, we're in the we just finished Justified and we're we're either gonna watch Deadwood or Firefly. Mission next. log. Mission, Mission log. log. Thank you. Mission That's log is the uh, is the Rod Roddenberry Ken Ray show. Yeah. You know who's the sweetest guy in the world? Rod Roddenberry. He is. I have heard that. From Ken. Light. <laughs> yeah. No, I had a, uh, I used to have a party at Macworld every year for my fans, and he came one year, and we did a thing where uh, people could call into a Google Hangout who couldn't come to, to oh, Macworld yeah. mm -hmm. and could join in the party. And he sat there and talked to them for like a half hour, put on the headphones and talked to him. And then he just kind of left all of a sudden. It was like, okay, whatever, you know, that's fine. And then all of a sudden he comes running back and he goes, oh my God, I forgot to say thank you. Thank you so much. And shook my hand. Aww. And he said, man, that's good parenting. And he said, well, no, it's a really good nanny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny yeah he's a sweetheart well no i um uh, i feel like i read something recently about him saying that getting back into or getting into covering star trek is kind of a way for him to feel like he's getting to know his father in a way that he never did yeah yeah he did a um he did a, a movie 
um, the movie. that was a documentary yeah, it was the movie, about right. it. Yeah, and I wish they would play that over and over and over again. It was it was phenomenal. It was so interesting to see him discover what his father meant to people. Yeah, and it, it wasn't really, it was, he wasn't so much trying to say that you know he didn't know his father at all growing up, but he's like you know when I was growing up, well, the, the, he was just my dad. You know, yeah. I didn't yeah. really well, take that much also interest a Star in what Wars he did because that was his work. Yeah, exactly. And he's yeah, like, yeah. I was a Star Wars fan. I didn't care what my dad yeah. did for work. They show him with like an R two D two cake yeah. and one yeah. of his birthdays, that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, that was it. That was a. Uh, I loved that documentary. I felt really bad before it came out. I was talking to him, and he was talking about what he was learning, and he said, like, you know, Lieutenant Ohura being the first black officer. You know, that was huge. And, and I said, man, as I was, you know, what it meant to little girls everywhere. And I said. I always thought of her as the secretary because she answered the phone. Mm, mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, no, that's exactly what she looked like. <laughs> it's like he thought I had this profile on me. And she was always like, you know, the Klingons online, too, for you, Captain Kirk. <laughs> well, and that that it, it all depends on the perspective you bring into it. Right. Like yeah. that's that's what that shows. That's is, what you're expecting to see. You know, if you're if you're an African-American girl, you're going to say like, wow, a woman who looks like me is in, you know, is up on the bridge of the Enterprise, and that's amazing. And if you're someone like you, you're and who's just seeing a woman, you're like, oh, a woman's answering the phone. That's a totally different perspective. <laughs> yeah, I felt bad. Trek Nation, Steve says, that's what it was called, the movie. Trek Nation. They played it like twice, and I don't think you can like get it on Netflix or anything, and you should yeah. be able to. Okie dokie. Um. AT&T supports net neutrality. Oh, you can buy it on DVD. I did not know that. Bob's Burgers and Futurama are on Hulu now, in case anyone was worried. <sighs> okay, Doc. I think I, I think I did. I think I published the show without what? screwing it up too much. Yeah. Can happen. I mean, not too much. Does that mean I'm dismissed? No. Okay. I'm double checking <laughs> to make sure <laughs> that I did it right. Yes, it does look like I did it right. Anthony uh, Lemos has volunteered to, to spruce up our show notes for us, too, and he's already in there making them look nice. So if you see nicer show notes, thank Ethan Kane, either on Twitter or in, or in chat when you see him. Uh, that is it for us on the stream. Wait. Thank you all wait, wait. for joining us. Allison, wait, wait. yes. Fred says... Fred says Whoopi Goldberg famously said, there's a black lady on TV and she's not a maid. Right. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye. Bye.